Uh, do an introduction. First of all, I'm Kurt Dunbar, and I teach history at Skagit Valley College here. Been here about 20 years. And I, uh, I started here in 97, um, about the time that Jill Fugit being started uh, really uh, being ill. Uh, she, uh, I knew about her. Her, her uh, reputation certainly preceded her. But she wasn't working much. She was very, very ill about the time I started. So I, I never knew Jill Fugit. Uh, but I knew her through her colleagues, and uh, I heard nothing but uh, amazing things about her. And this series is dedicated to the memory of Jill Fugit. Uh, these series are done. There is usually about one a month. There's going to be eight this year. I should have made some handouts of the of the, the talks this uh, uh, this year. There's some good ones, uh, but I'll I'll try and do that before any of you leave, or leave me your name, and I can send you a link to that schedule. But uh, again, uh, just to make sure that we, uh, we know why we're all here, and this is in honor of our colleague, Jill Fugit, and what she brought to this college. She helped start the union. Uh, she was an amazing uh, figure in pulling the campus together, uh, the collegiality. Uh, the campus culture that we have today is, is very much a, a part of uh, a Jill Fugit. So that still carries on, though, though she is gone now. So. Uh, you know why we're here, why it's called the, the Jill Fugit series, if you didn't know. Uh, just a tiny bit about myself before I get into the presentation. Um, I've worked on cruise ships a lot for the last 20 years. I've spent most of the summers, uh, most of those years and most of those summers at sea, uh, working on these, these big old uh, cattle barges. And uh, that's what I've come to think of them. After working on them that long, I don't think of them much as luxury liners. I just, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people on a boat. But they're fun, and I've seen a lot of amazing things on them over the years. I did my master's thesis on a ship. So I've always had an interest in maritime history and ships in particular. And uh, working on ships has, has been fun. It's been great. And, and being at sea, I mostly love being at sea, even if it's on a cruise ship. And uh, Living in Alaska, I lived in Alaska for about 10 years, and I kept hearing about the old heyday of the Bering Sea Patrol and the Revenue Marine, as it was called, or, or the, the Cutter Service that was attached to the Treasury. And I, it's always been, I've always been curious about it, and I studied it a lot in an ancillary fashion when I was doing my master's thesis on a ship, uh, a ship of science called the Albatross, and I got another presentation on that in a pipe that I maybe I'll do next year. But um, I always was running into, uh, into the Revenue Service because it played such a pivotal part in the early history of Alaska. And that's what this is about. Um, I cannot go any further without giving an enormous amount of credit to this book, which I leaned on very heavily. Uh, short of plagiarism, but I leaned on it a lot. It's just such a great source. And so I, I did want to give credit to this book uh, by Truman Strawbridge and uh, Dennis Noble. It is a definitive work on this period. I used it. I did some research. I was in Alaska this summer. So I was always in the archives in the State Library a lot. I did a, boy, it's amazing what you can get on the internet now. I spent a lot of time on the Google machine uh, looking for images that are in this presentation. Uh, but I wanted to reference this book. And if you want to know about the subject more than what I'm going to tell you today, this is the sort. The Revenue Cutter Service. Uh, also called the Revenue Marine. It began before we even had a Navy. Uh, the Revenue Cutter Service was a part of the Department of the Treasury, which was one of the first cabinet positions uh, in, in the new United States. And uh, the Navy wasn't formed until uh, a half a dozen or so years later. So the Revenue Cutter Service is actually, and it would turn into the Coast Guard, and I'll talk about that at the end of the presentation. Um, it's actually older than the Navy. And mainly, uh, these cutter vessels were to go out and pursue smugglers and try and get anybody that was dodging their taxes. Department of Treasury. It made sense. And that's why they were in Alaska. Uh, was it, was a, it was a new territory, and they, they didn't want the taxes getting away, and so they sent the revenue cutters up there. And it turned out the revenue cutters would be almost the only presence 
of the United States and Alaska for several decades. And I'll talk about that here in a minute, the details of that. But those men on those crews, on those ships, um, were the, the thin blue line. They, they were the representation of the United States, the authority. Uh, they were floating courthouses. They were floating hospitals. Uh, they brought aid to native peoples. Uh, again, all of these things I'm going to elaborate on. Uh, they enforced law, and not just treasury law, but American law, uh, chasing pirate sealers all over the Bering Sea, trying to keep them from exhausting that resource, and uh, rescuing whalers who get themselves in pickles and get jammed up in that Arctic ice, uh, trying to search for errant explorers, sometimes not very successfully. It just did a little bit about uh, a little bit of everything, and uh, we're going to look at those things, those different facets of the Cutter Service in Alaska. It starts early. It actually starts before purchase of Alaska. In 1865, this vessel, the Shubrick, was the the uh, flagship for a survey expedition. 1865. Alaska wasn't purchased until 1867, and uh, this ship was up there with a crew from. Uh, a telegraph survey that wanted to, were thinking of putting a cable across the Bering Strait to Asia. And uh, there were guys up there looking at the land. One was uh, Robert Kennicott uh, in his little uh, cap there, and William Healy Dahl, who later on would become a very notable naturalist. And uh, you see them here in their telegraph uh, survey uniforms. They were unique. They were different than an army uniform, though they're similar. And both of these guys, Dahl in particular, uh, Kennecott would die in Alaska. They were unsure. It was kind of a mystery. Uh, I think it might have been a heart, uh, heart condition. But Dahl was sending reports. He and other surveyors were sending reports of what was in Alaska. They, they were, of course, were doing the survey route for the cable, but they were astounded at the, the, you know, they had gone up there with the preconception that many people had about Alaska. It barely got purchased because everybody thought it was Seward's icebox, that it was a wasteland. They're writing reports of the timber and the fisheries and the minerals up there. Uh, later on, the Kennecott Mines would be named after Robert Kennecott. And they discovered the, uh, the copper deposits up near the uh, Copper River, appropriately, where the famous red salmon come from. These reports are making it back to Washington, D.C., and they're hitting the desk of one guy in particular. And his name was Charles Sumner. He was a senator from Massachusetts, and he was key in, in turning the vote in the Senate in favor of purchasing Alaska. It only passed by one vote. And Charles Sumner is probably singularly responsible for swaying enough senators to, to buy it that it did get purchased by the United States. $7.2 million, by the way, about two cents an acre, the deal of the century. And uh, Sumner was able to persuade them largely with the reports from the survey expedition, which was led by a revenue cutter, by an old uh, paddle wheeler, the Schubert. And uh, Dahl, in particular, was sending those detailed reports talking about what was up, what was up there. And, uh, it had helped to persuade Senate to purchase. So from the very beginning, even before the beginning, the, the Cutter Service is a part of the history of Alaska. Uh, the Cutter was sent up, the Lincoln that brought the party, that brought the flag that was raised at Sitka in the transfer from Russia to the United States. The Cutter did that. Right away, uh, a sleek little Cutter was sent out into the Bering Sea to survey the resources there. Uh, this is the Wyanda. And it's with the, uh, with the guy this summer whose uh, specialty was Arctic exploration, uh, Ed, uh, Ed Nelson. And uh, he, uh, he called the, the, the sort of frenzy uh, for Arctic expedition, he called it a, a romantic obsession. And there would be one expedition after another going up uh, to into the Arctic, trying to look for uh, the North Pole, trying to look for a landmass up there. A lot of it ill-fated, including uh, the George Washington DeLong expedition, often 
called the Jeannette Expedition after his ship, the Jeannette. In 1880, he uh, headed into up the Bering Strait and into the uh, Arctic Ocean, the uh, Chukchi Sea, uh, celebrated with fanfare as he left San Francisco. It was advertised and promoted uh, by a newspaper which helped to publicize it, and the whole country was pretty excited about it. And DeLong uh, headed up the coast. He had been to, this is a picture of a ship uh, the year prior in Greenland. And he thought a ship was pretty hardy and could weather the conditions up there. But Greenland is not the Arctic, not the Arctic Ocean at least. And uh, it's a wooden hulled vessel. And it got up there into the Arctic and quickly got locked in the ice. Its hull was crushed and the ship was lost and the crew desperately stranded. Uh, here you can see the, the trek, the path up north, up the coast, uh, through the Bering Strait, and then on into, uh, an, into the Arctic itself. It, it's crushed uh, somewhere. You can probably see it way up north here. It drifts a little bit after being crushed and eventually sinks, in, uh, sinks to the bottom. The crew uh, made it off the ship and with some of their provisions and then became, uh, be, uh, came a really, really desperate s a scramble with their longboats and their supplies over pack ice that I don't think any of us could even imagine. It, it was a living nightmare. And it exhausted uh, uh, DeLong's crew, and they're trying to make landfall uh, before all of this pack ice melts and there's nothing but water underneath them. In the meantime, they were lost, and they had not been reported and because of the publicity and the fanfare, everybody was concerned what happened to the Jeanette. And they sent a revenue cutter up there. They sent the Corwin uh, to go look for, uh, for DeLong and his crew, or the ship, the Jeanette. They did know, uh, not know at this time that Jeanette was lost. On that ship was an a, a, a executive commander. Second in command was a guy named Michael Healy. And we'll hear more, hear more about Healy here in a moment. The Corwin itself got stuck in the ice. It was a hardy little ship, and it managed to extract itself and make its way out of the Arctic, but um, never found along that first season. The next season, it sent again back into the Arctic to try and find uh, DeLong and his party, and doesn't succeed. But on board is a guy who uh, later on would be quite famous, John Muir, a naturalist. It was one of his first trips to Alaska. And he went up on a revenue cutter, the Corwin. He wrote uh, his stories about the Arctic and Alaska in the cruise of the Corwin, one of the first books published about Alaska and one of the first uh, books published by Muir. Again, the second season, they did not find the Jeanette or their crew. What had happened is they had uh, finally uh, made landfall and uh, they got separated. They separated in two different groups, and one group uh, was rescued by uh, local Siberian natives and, uh, and saved and survived. Uh, DeLong and um, most of his men did not. They froze to death in the wastes of uh, northern Siberia. And uh, they put up a lonely cairn to uh, commemorate uh, he, he and his men, and there is a placard at the uh, the Naval Academy in, in Annapolis that commemorates uh, that tragic expedition, the Jeanette Expedition of 1881-82. The Corwin would be William Healy's first command, Captain w Michael Healy. And he would help to undertake what would become now a seasonal event, the Bering Sea Patrol, up into the Arctic, along the coast, into the Bering Sea, up through the Bering Strait and as far as I could get into the Arctic that was safe. You can see this in this season, uh, they made it all the way to Herschel Island in, in, off the coast of Canada. So they got quite a bit into the Arctic. And uh, this became a yearly tradition. It became, it's not officially yet the Bering Sea Patrol, but it's, it's the precursor to it. It's the predecessor to it. Politically, there are things going on. And as I mentioned before, Alaska would be very, very much uh, pulled by the whims of Congress, or the neglect of Congress, really more appropriately. It was purchased in 1867, and until 1877 was more or less run by the Army. 
uh, the Army was the authority in Alaska. They had a few outposts at uh, Wrangell and Sitka, Yakutat, Kenai. But they were on the coast. They had very little real control of Alaska. And come 1877, with the uh, Troubles on the Plains and the Nez Perce War was the same year, uh, they left. They just left Alaska. Uh, lock, stock, and barrel. They, they picked up and all the, all the U.S. troops left Alaska. And it was left to the Navy. Uh, but not before there was a terrible period, two years of absolute total neglect. Alaska went, it went to seed. It, 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 was, it was chaos. Uh, no law up there, all sorts of <laughs> things going on, uh, poaching, smuggling, uh, the, the transport of alcohol and selling it to natives, with, uh, which was always sort of controlled by the government. And uh, eventually the Navy stepped up just uh, out of sheer desperation and embarrassment. There was an incident where uh, uh, things became so desperate in Sitka that the citizens of Sis Sitka sent a small boat to Canada and begged the Canadian government for help to protect them. And, then, and the Canadian government sent a man of war, a British man of war, uh, the Osprey, up to protect the citizens uh, of Sitka uh, from native attack. Uh, they had seen the weakness of the authorities there and began to make their move. And uh, they had the, the citizens of Sitka terrorized, and it was the British who actually protected uh, the, uh, the Sitkins. And uh, later on, uh, an American ship would show up. A cutter was sent in the middle of the winter, which was very unusual, uh, to assist the Osprey. But uh, this, <laughs> once it got there, Sitkins asked the Osprey to stay. They said, don't, don't leave, don't leave. It was a real embarrassment. And, and finally the federal government acted and um, eventually transferred most of the authority uh, vested in the courts and the laws in Alaska. And it wasn't a territory. Alaska was a, a revenue district where you collected taxes. It didn't even have territorial status. It wouldn't get that until 1912. So it was sort of just cut loose. And um, in that vacuum, more or less, by default, the Cutter Service, the Treasury Department, began to be the authority, the American authority in Alaska. That was in 1884. About the time uh, Alaska created uh, the Organic Act, and it, this was the first step towards territorial status, but it wasn't, full, uh, it wasn't official territory. And uh, it adopted the legal system of Oregon, and it specifically put the, the uh, revenue cutter service from the Treasury in the authority of Alaska. That would persist for the next 20 years, almost 20 years, till 1912. And then this is when we would see uh, William, or uh, Michael Healy again. And Michael Healy was put in command of his, the, the rush, and then after that, his former. Uh, vessel, the Corwin, and most famously of all, the ship that became almost inextricable from his name and, and his person was the Bear. Beautiful, beautiful revenue cutter. It was actually built in Scotland, uh, but purchased uh, a, as a cutter and sent to Alaska and would be one of the most famous ships in, in the history of Alaska and the history of the cutter service, actually, with Michael Healy a, at its command for nine years. And this is when Michael Healy became Hell Roar and Mike. <laughs> and for good reason. He was a, a notorious uh, drinker. He had a fiery temper. He, uh, did not, uh, he did not weather fools lightly. He, uh, he was a, a, had a firm hand, and that's what Alaska sort of needed at the time after those years of neglect. And of course, being in command of the bear, the name, too, sort of uh, brought weight with it as well. Here's some fanciful pictures, some polar bears. And on the bear itself, I love this picture, because here on the bow spirit, the, uh, the figurehead is a bear with his claws out. And you could always see which ship it was when it came into port, because there was that bear in the front of it. The bear lasted a long time, too. The bear is almost a story unto itself. And right away, the work of the Cutter Service began. Michael Healy going up, and uh, more and more whalers had been going into the, into the Arctic waters to seek whales. 
they had been uh, hunting whales to extinction in the, in the whaling grounds in the South Pacific and in, in East Asia, and began to poke into uh, the Arctic, and of course, with that, always seemed to come trouble. Getting caught in the ice, getting greedy, staying up there too long, going too far, and getting stuck once conditions closed in on them and they got stuck in the ice. It happened over and over and over again. And uh, ships caught in the ice, the hulls crush, crews stranded on the ice with no food, long, long distances from land, and time and time again, the bear was sent up there to save them. Uh, plowing through the ice, a really a hardy ship, that steam engine getting it into places. It's, uh, you can see here in this, illust this painting, uh, the Corwin, it's got the Corwin in tow. The Corwin eventually went into private hands. It had been a revenue cutter and eventually became sort of a, a, a merchant ship in Alaska, a packet. Another photograph, same thing, the bear plowing through the ice with the Corwin in tow, going out there and rescuing those stranded whalers. Time and time again, they were awfully glad to see the bear coming along. Uh, no, no. Um, is the bear a steel hull? No, I think it was a wooden hull vessel. I'd have to look that up. The real peak of that came in uh, 1897 when eight whaling ships would be stranded up there. Eight. Uh, uh, once winter ensued, they got locked in the ice and an in, a very, very elaborate, uh, amazing rescue effort uh, headed by the Revenue Marine would send the bear up uh, to try and rescue him, and the bear itself got trapped in the ice in the Bering Strait and couldn't get in up there to help. And so the resolution to that was to send an overland expedition over a thousand miles along the shoreline with a herd of reindeer to try and uh, uh, uses food to, su to supply those, those guys trapped on the ice. Uh, three officers, actually two officers and, and the ship's surgeon uh, led that, that party up there along the coast in that, uh, it was actually 1,400 mile trek up to try and rescue those str uh, stranded whalers. You can see their, their trek along the coast here on that dotted line and succeeded. Got to those ships, uh, had their, their reindeer and other supplies with them, and not a single person died. In the eight ships that got stranded, uh, all of them survived. It's an amazing story. And the bear, once it was freed up too, it was stuck in the ice, uh, headed north to go and pick them up and rescue them. Uh, not all the ships survived that winter. Their hulls were crushed and they sank. Some did. Where, this is, this is what I did a lot of my graduate work on, was the first seal controversy, was the protecting of, of, of American resources in Alaska. And this swirled around this animal, the northern fur seal. And they have a pelagic migration in which uh, thousands of them do sort of a circular migration south, uh, off the coastal waters of BC and, and uh, even Oregon and Washington, and then head back into the Bering Sea to, uh, to breed on the, on the Privilof Islands, which are smack dab in the middle of the Bering Sea there. You can see where the arrow's pointing, the Privilofs. And huge, huge rookeries there, uh, millions of them. And uh, they became a target uh, for hunting. Uh, the, rich, the rich pelt of the fur seal was worth quite a bit of money. And, uh, the United States had established uh, uh, regulations to, to prevent the overhunting of, of fur seals on the islands, but they could not control the hunting on the high seas, in which and during that pelagic migration, many of those seals were taken by uh, sealing countries like Japan, uh, Great Britain, mostly Canadians, and uh, Canada was, was more or less still a part of Great Britain then, even though it got uh, independence in, in 1867, and Russia were all sealing countries, and of course American sealers too, going up there and uh, taking those seals um, on the high seas during their pelagic migration. Now the, the natives had hunted them in a sustainable fashion, of course, 
and they had hunted them from these amazing seagoing uh, kayaks and with harpoons that had lines on them so that they could retrieve them. But uh, when uh, seals were, sh were shot, um, they sank. And so thousands, perhaps millions of seals were wasted because when they shot, they just sank to the bottom if, if you couldn't get to them quickly enough. Uh, with females, it was a triple whammy. Uh, usually females were pregnant in the last part of their pelagic migration, and they also usually had a nursing pup ashore. And so when a female was killed, three seals were lost. It didn't take long for it to have a toll on those rookeries and to see a genuine, a visible depletion of those first, first seal rookeries out there in the Privilofs. This is a, uh, a sealing vessel. A little schooner, sealing schooner. There were hundreds of them. And uh, one of the major ports for these sealers was Victoria. Uh, up in, uh, in Canada, again, still largely overseen as, as a, Br a British commonwealth. So uh, Britain was always sort of its protector. You can see that clearly on the sealing vessels in Victoria Harbor and the names on their, on their tail end there, Victoria, and their, their home port. These vessels would go up by the hundreds and uh, start to take those seals. A lot of them had native hunters with them using some of those sealing techniques at first, but after a while it just became a free-for-all. They realized that they could take more of them, even the ones they couldn't retrieve. Uh, they could still take more of them with firearms, and they just, just started killing them uh, in uh, just a complete in, indiscriminate fashion. And uh, the U.S. government had had enough. Uh, it had seen the, the rookeries disappearing out there in the Privil Ops. They'd seen the revenue uh, from those fur seal pelts begin to decline. The fur seal probably paid for Alaska. In the first 20 years of Alaska, about $6 million went directly to the United States government uh, in, in the form of fur seal pelts and the sale of, of fur seals. Uh, the purchase was 7.2. So nearly all of that in 20 years was gained back in, in the fur seal trade itself. Well, the bear was sent up along with a number of other revenue cutters with word to stop those sealers. And most controversially of all is to use the full faith and credit of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the cutter service and the men and the crews of those cutters to intercept sealers on the high seas. Now, an array of ships, and I'm going to show you, show you some ships because I like ships and I love some of these pictures and the cut of some of these vessels. This was the Thetis, another very, very active cutter up there. Uh, this is the McCullough. No, that is the uh, Walcott. That's the, this is the McCullough. This is the McCullough under sail, a painting of it under sail. There's the, the Corwin again when it was still a cutter. And the Grant. And this is the, uh, the Perry and the Rush. On the 4th of July, out in the Aleutians there, you can see the date on it. Or no, it's in Sitka. Uh, firing its cannons. That looks a lot like the Aleutians. Doesn't look anything like Sitka. Oh well. Got to trust the, the inscription, I guess. Fourth of July, firing its guns. Even the ship I studied in my graduate work, uh, this uh, ship of science, the Albatross, ended up being attached to uh, the Revenue Marine Fleet, the, the Northern Squadron. And in one summer, uh, the Albatross, in fact, boarded more pirate sealers than, than any other ship in the Northern Squadron. So all of these ships were put into, into action to try and, and, and stop the, the, the slaughter, the, the, the extinction of the Northern Fur Seal. And in seizing them, uh, capturing these sealers, these Canadian sealers, and bringing them ashore and impounding uh, the vessels, here are three Canadian sealers impounded uh, out in uh, Unalaska, Dutch Harbor today, it created an international incident. You cannot seize ships on the high seas. That's piracy. You just don't do it. The high seas are the high seas. It's a commons. 
and the Canadians had a legal right to those seals as much as any other country. The United States claimed ownership of those seals on the high seas, and you had the recipe for a huge legal and diplomatic crash, a clash, and really a conflict. Um, at one point, uh, the American Secretary of State, James G. Blaine, wrote in his diary, uh, it became so intense with Great Britain over the seizure of Canadian vessels on the high seas, he said, I am beginning a war diary. Blaine thought we were going to go to war with Britain over fur seals. A lot of that was exacerbated by this guy, uh, Henry Wood Elliott, who had actually worked in the Privilofs for the government at one time and became uh, one of the first conservationists in the United States when that wasn't even really hardly a word yet. He wrote books about what was going on out there. He got public opinion on his side, which in turn put more pressure on the United States. Uh, the United States went out there and seized a lot of those sealers because Wood was talking about it and bringing it to light in the books and articles that he was publishing. Yeah, here's the quote. This is the beginning of a war diary, U.S. Secretary James G. Blaine, and uh, a cartoon showing the arbitration that began to try and settle this is issue uh, between, primarily between Great Britain and the United States. Great Britain took on the responsibility of defending Canadian sealing rights, and the two went nose to nose uh, in, in a diplomatic ar arbitration in which uh, the first seal uh, convention adjudicated in favor, not surprisingly, of Great Britain, uh, supporting its rights of freedom of the seas to be able to go out and take those seals on the high seas. It was a real blow uh, to the Americans. It was a, a failure uh, legally and diplomatically but it was mostly a failure for the poor fur seals. The sealing continued, and many American sealers now saw an opening that this, since it, uh, the sealing couldn't be stopped on the high seas, everybody threw in on it until uh, the seals were very near extinction. Uh, this is the line of the arbitration line of the, what was called the Paris Award, uh, the final arbitration that said where the sealing could occur. It was basically anywhere. And uh, the countries loosely agreed that they wouldn't take too many, and of course they took as many as they possibly could to try and uh, make as much money as they could. Uh, so much so that eventually uh, they would be called back into negotiations. All the countries began to realize that there weren't going to be any fur seals. Uh, the Americans kept a presence out there, including naval vessels, and then you see some of the vessels of the Revenue Marine, the uh, Cutter Service out there, always ever present. In 1911, an amazing thing happened. It actually was finalized in 1905, and Henry Wood Elliott helped to draw up the treaty, which was eventually finally signed five years later in 1911, and it's the first seal treaty that forbids the hunting of fur seals altogether. It is the first international treaty in the world to protect a marine species. It's really quite significant in the history of conservation and even, di even diplomacy. Uh, in the process, too, included in the first seal negotiations and the first seal treaty in 1911 were these guys, the sea otters. And the sea otters are here today because they were included in that treaty because they were on the edge of extinction, too. There are some estimates that there were less than 1,000 sea otters between California and uh, the Kamchatka Peninsula in East Asia. Not very many. In fact, hunting sea otters had become uh, unprofitable because they couldn't find any. They couldn't go out. There were so few that it wasn't worth going out to, to take sea otters any longer. That treaty protected the few that were left. I'm glad, I'm absolutely ecstatic to tell you that today, sea otters are almost at their old numbers and almost entirely in their old range, uh, which covers almost the entire rim of the North Pacific. It is a genuine victory, a success story in conservation, and largely came about you know, through the efforts of the Cutter Service, which was out there holding the line, out there chasing those pirate sealers around for years and years. the dark side. Nothing 
is an unalloyed good. And the cutter service has a, a very, very deep blemish on, on its record. And that came from Michael Healy. This is the village of uh, Wrangell in Alaska, in southeast Alaska, in the Alexander Archipelago. And um, it had uh, been uncooperative. Then other villages began to bristle at the American yoke, you might say. And uh, there was a, uh, an incident that occurred with a, a, a whaler uh, on a, a native whaler who was said to be a shaman uh, on, a native, on a whaling crew. He was killed by an explosive harpoon. And he wanted uh, the, his relatives, his tribe, uh, the Klingit the Ang at Angoon had wanted, um, had wanted compensation. They wanted some blankets, and that was traditional. And uh, they were stonewalled. They weren't given any satisfaction whatsoever, so the natives at Angoon seized a couple of hostages and wanted they would return those for uh, compensation for the death of, of that, that whaling, uh, uh, that whaler, that native whaler. Well, that was considered provocative, and uh, Michael Healy was asked to uh, escort a arm tug to uh, Angoon, which he gladly did, and they steamed off to Angoon and laid off the shore, and both uh, the arm tug and the, uh, the Corwin uh, bombarded the village of Angoon. A number of people were killed. They were driven out of that village. Uh, the cuttermen uh, came ashore. And, uh, and burned the village to the ground, uh, taking a number of priceless cultural artifacts and um, basically left a very, very, very dark chapter in, in the Cutter Service's record in Alaska. And Michael Healy was a part of that. That's surprising because Michael Healy had had a record of, of treating the native peoples in Alaska very sympathetically and very compassionately. Um, it didn't jibe with, with, with what, what he uh, had done at other times. It's sort of a puzzle, and it's a part of the complex character, the volatile character of Hell, Roar, and Might. Uh, cutters came into shore, provided food, provided clothing, brought, brought people on the boats where uh, the ship's surgeon or sometimes even doctors were on board to... Uh, to attend to them, uh, all sorts of maladies, uh, including injuries or diseases. Um, at one time, all of the Cutter captains in Alaska were made full-blown legal commissioners, equivalent to judges, in order to prosecute uh, whaling captains who had brought women on board, essentially as prostitutes, uh, for, for these whalers. They were kidnapped and held captive on these, these whaling ships. Uh, the government gave those captains the authority to come on those ships and, and uh, seize the captains, prosecute them, uh, seize assets, and fine them in an attempt to try and keep this practice from occurring. At one point, uh, so many whales were taken, and you can see evidence, too, of the hunting of walruses. There are walrus tusks there in the picture at the bottom. Uh, and, and taking the seals, they were killing off the food sources for these native peoples, the Yupik and the Inupiaq, who lived on those marine sources almost exclusively. And um, they began to starve to death. They were dying in droves. Often cutter ships would come into some of those villages and they were completely abandoned. So, so ravaged by disease and starvation that the dead weren't even buried. Um, this was alarming, and it was alarming to... to uh, to Captain Healy as well. It can be lying uh, his actions at Angoon. Uh, he got together with a Presbyterian minister, uh, Sheldon Jackson, and they, uh, they, went, they hatched an idea between them to go to Siberia and get reindeer, put them on the ships. They hauled them on the ships with windlasses and pulleys. Uh, you can see the reindeer on the shore here. Here's a rare picture of a, of a reindeer being hoisted on board and hauled across the Bering Sea from Siberia uh, 
to some of those villages as, as a food source. They not only did that, but they brought Siberian reindeer herders to train uh, the Yupik and the Inupiaq, who had, had no uh, knowledge at all of herding reindeer, um, to help them out. They even brought Laplanders, a few Lapland herders, uh, reindeer herders, to teach the, the Yupik and the Inupiaq how to, uh, how to domesticate those animals and take care of them. Now, reindeer are different than caribou. They look exactly alike. They actually are the same species, but caribou uh, are not domesticated. Reindeer are, and that's the difference. But then in the scheme, you can see Sheldon Jackson here, again in the middle, uh, between he and, and Captain Healy, uh, saved a lot of native peoples from starvation with this, this ploy to bring reindeer across from Siberia. Again, the cutter service at its best with uh, one of its very, very controversial captains, uh, Hell Roar and Mike. And to this day, that story is still told in the villages up and down the Alaska coast, and many, many of uh, those villages still keep huge herds of reindeer. Another facet of this was the, uh, the patrol of the, of the uh, cutter service. This odd-looking cutter, it's actually a river boat, the Nunavak. And it was captained, uh, captained by John Cantwell, who made sure that the, that the tr passage on the Yukon River uh, during the great Klondike Gold Rush strike in 1897, 98, 99 uh, was orderly, and that, that the, the supplies were able to, to get to, uh, to Dawson City and the gold fields. But at one point, a, uh, an, epidemic, an epidemic broke out, smallpox of all things. And uh, Cantwell made sure that, that there was a quarantine, that no vessel got up the Yukon River unless going through and making sure uh, he took part in fumigating entire ships and crews to prevent that disease from spreading, which was deadly enough to, to Europeans and Americans, but absolutely almost 100% fatal uh, to Native peoples because they didn't, they didn't have any... Uh, any resistance to those diseases, no immunities whatsoever. And it was really a very, very, uh, it ravaged many, many places uh, that, that, uh, that when it arrived in native villages. So Cantwell was uh, instrumental in, uh, in keeping the peace on the Yukon River and keeping that epidemic from spreading, mostly to native peoples. So, uh, odd little duty of, of the revenue service on the Yukon River. And always, the Cutter Service had always had a very unique and a very positive relationship with Native peoples, helping them, aiding them, bringing them food, medical service, trying to enforce the law of people when they were often exploited, especially some of the women sexually, the men uh, treated as slaves, uh, almost slave, like slave laborers on some of those whalers. And uh, still today, there, there is a very much a positive attitude of uh, many native peoples for, for today, what is the Coast Guard? And uh, those ships took it. They went out there in storm and in, in, in high seas, and here is the, is, uh, the Thetis all beat apart uh, after uh, making a transit across the Bering Sea. And uh, other ships like the beautiful Perry, uh, ashore, uh, aground on rocks and uh, not retrieved. Its, its crew was, no one died, but, but Perry was lost, uh, as was the Tahoma, same thing, hit some rocks, sank. This is hazardous duty. And a lot of, a lot of those guys have put it on the line to go out there and, uh, and serve the people of Alaska. And that they did. Uh, no matter what the conditions, what the weather, what the season, uh, they were there. They were there for Alaskans. And uh, today, in Alaska, I lived, like I say, I lived there many years. There's still a, a fond attachment uh, to, to what would become the Coast Guard. One of the largest Coast Guard bases, I think it may be the largest, is on Kodiak Island. It's huge. It is, has its own city. Uh, I saw it there when I was in Kodiak this, this summer and I uh, was astounded how large it was. And uh, those vessels are out of there and out of that base all the time and covering the waters of the uh, of the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea and the coast. And um, yeah, it's, it's uh, 
The, it became the Revenue Cutter Service became the Coast Guard in 1915. It combined the old Life Saving Service and the Lighthouse Service into one service, uh, the Coast Guard. And uh, still out there doing, doing its job and doing its duty. And I love this. And it's still there today. When we were, uh, when in the ship I was on this summer, the Serenity was in Seward, or docked right next to it in the railroad dock in Seward, was, uh, was this ice cutter, this, this ice, ice breaker. You know the name of it? It's the Healy. Yeah, it's the Healy. Named after Hell Roar and Mike. So Hell Roar and Mike, in a way, still plies the waters of Alaska and the, and the Arctic. And that was quite an adventure for young men who worked on those ships. And I love this poem. Full many a sailor points with pride to cruises o'er the ocean wide, but they cannot compare with me, for I've sailed the Bering Sea. While though you've weathered fierce gale and every ocean you have sailed, you cannot a salty sailor be until you've sailed the Bering Sea. I did this presentation on the Bering Sea, and I got a huge applause when I read it <laughs> to people who were with me crossing the Bering Sea. So it was culmination of, for me professionally of, of 20 years of research on this subject. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming today. Are there any questions? Anybody have any questions about this stuff? And I think about it, I think the bear was a steel hull vessel. What they called iron hull then, but it wasn't iron steel. I noticed that bear was spelled with an H. Yeah, you see that spelling, the old spelling sometimes with the H in it. The uh, very spelling disorder, especially when they first started naming stuff up there. But after a while, the convention was without, without the H. And that's, I love this painting of the bear flying the sea. There's some ice in the water, and there's a peak <laughs> to the, the foggy shore. Boy, that, that's classic coast of Alaska smell right there. I've seen it a thousand times. How long did a uh, fellow Roaring Mark, Mike live? Do you know? Uh, he, he died, I think, in 1902. He oh. did, died fairly young. He was a chronic alcoholic. Uh, he had been drummed out of the service once, stripped of his command, but was so indispensable to the service up there that they brought him back. And uh, controversial, and I'll tell you a story about Hell Roar and Mike that will blow your mind. He was a quarter African American, and he was commanded a ship in an American service, and that's almost unheard of. And the only reason he was able to do that was you saw the pictures of him, he passed. He passed his wife. But his mother was half black, and she was a slave. Well, actually, Michael Healy was born a slave, too. His father sent him away. All of his children, uh, the product of that union, uh, were sent away and educated elsewhere out of the South. So they got an education, and they were no longer chattel. They, would, they, were, they were never actually slaves themselves that were born into slavery. But Michael Healy had said, you can analyze him psychologically, and there's been a lot of that. One biography of, of Healy said that he was an alcoholic and he was so volatile because he was living on this razor's edge and being exposed. It would have destroyed his career. And there's no doubt about that, given the attitudes of the time. And so he kind of lived in constant fear of being exposed for what he was which was a quarter African-American. And uh, you can analyze that all you want. It, it can, you can attribute some of his behavior to that, I suppose. But it adds another really interesting dimension to a really, really interesting guy. He has a city, a, a town, a small town up in the interior named after him, uh, Ely. And uh, there's coal, there's a big coal mine there. But, uh, everybody in Alaska knows who Ely was, and everybody knows what the cutter said. And still a fresh memory, <coughs> excuse me, a fresh memory up there as it should be. And I just, I just kind of wanted to honor that. So, again, thanks for coming today. Hope you enjoyed it. What was the bear decommissioned? When was the bear decommissioned? Uh, the bear is an interesting story. The bear went on to be decommissioned from the cutter service 
around World War One, but then it continued to, to do service. It was brought back actually during World War II. And it was being towed in to be decommissioned and restored as a history ship when it, it was being towed, it sank off the coast of the Massachusetts. Uh, but it had a storied career. It went out as a volunteer <coughs> for a while and was uh, hired to be, because it was such a hardy ship to do Antarctic expeditions. And uh, the, the bear itself, like I say, is its own story. It's very fascinating. Thanks. Thanks again. Yeah.